to say to you and ready to bring it to you. Everybody under the sound of my voice, listen, young, old, children are dismissed over to my right here, your left, to go with Annie, uh, any age, uh, 10 or so and under, 11 or so and under, you're welcome to send your children. There is a crying room out there, you can go out if your child is, is challenged and struggling. But uh, how many know that uh, this is not your typical startup church? You know, when I started my first church, there was 12 people, and as I said, two kids, my own. And you kind of grow. I mean, all of a sudden, you know, we started this in a backyard, and uh, uh, 100 people were showing up in a backyard, and then you followed me to the dirty, salty dog saloon. <laughs> and uh, that was interesting, wasn't it? That was really interesting. And then you followed me over to the DCU Center, which was challenging at times, but it was a good time for us. It was the right thing for us to see if you really wanted to do this. And then here we are on the first Sunday. Who's here for the first time? Lift your hand if you're here for the first time. We welcome you to the gathering. We hope that you'll return. Come back, come back, come back. If you want to be on our email list or mailing list or something like that, would you slip up your hand? Because one of our ushers, and uh, I call him an usher, and him and his wife, uh, they just do their best. They have uh, information, a thing card that you can fill out. Actually, you can get as you leave. Now, you know what the announcements are of the gathering, don't you? There just are none, and so we just get on with things. So, uh, you know. But there will be in the future, but those announcements will be about events and soul winning and, and reaching people for the cause of Christ. Amen? All right, so let's get on with the message today. Release it. I, I want to talk to you about releasing it. How many think this could be a good message for you? So that, that may be something you need to release. Let me take you to a scripture, and you probably wonder how this will work in, but it will work in. Listen really, really closely. For the next 20 minutes. The good thing about the gathering, I don't keep you for an hour and a half, two hours. How many think that's great to go home for a hamburger? You know, one preacher said to me one time, Joe, um, other than um, the orange one, will you just turn all the whites down? There you go. Perfect. Oh, other than mine. <laughs> other, other than the orange one. There we go. Perfect. Yeah, that has some noise going on. All right. So listen, uh, Matthew 18 says this in verse 21. Then Peter, one of his disciples, came to Jesus and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him up to seven times. And Jesus said to him, no, I, I'm telling you seven times you know the scripture, don't you? There's a reason why you know this scripture. Seventy times, seven times you're to forgive. Do you know why you know the scripture so well? Because offense is done to you all too often, isn't it? The challenge of life that people bring into your life done all too often. And, I'm, and, and you know what? And, and so Peter was like, should I forgive him once, twice, six, seven, eight, nine, seven times? No, Jesus said 70 times 7 and over and over and over and over again. So, so the question isn't how many times to forgive somebody. The question is, is when are you going to let it go? Mm. Amen. When are you, you know, and most people say, well, I'm just not ready to talk to him, just not ready to talk to her because of the offense, of the offense. Listen. What do you care what the offense was anymore? The offense is over and done. And people say, well, you don't understand. Well, of course, I'm talking in semantics and in the general picture. Bring it down to your own self. But at some point, at some place in your life, unless you release it and let it go, it will hold you hostage forever. And how many are just tired of offenses holding you hostage forever, right? Wouldn't you just like to forgive someone and let it go? In yourself, you can't, but how many through it? No, through the power of Christ, you can do all things, right? You can do this. Everyone has faced some sort of betrayal, have you not? Everyone's faced some sort of betrayal or treachery that visits your life due to another. You can't escape people. Have you noticed that? 
Have you tried to escape evil? You've tried. But how many know they are like ticks of life? You step into the wilderness and you get the tick. And, and, the, and the Lord even said the world is like a field. And you step into the field of this world and people are like ticks. And how many know that there are just some you wish you could escape? But how many know you're just born with some of them? Some people you just can't choose, can you not? And at the end of the day, I'm telling you, you see, you, you know what? You can try to escape people. And how many know people have moved from other sides of this country to escape people? And trust me, I am a firm believer there are just some people you have to love on the phone. <laughs> I'm a firm believer in that. There are some people that five-minute phone conversations is plenty of love. How many are with me? <laughs> plenty of love. And, you know, but... The, the, the sad thing is, is what if the offender is you? And I'm not talking about offending other people. I'm talking about the offense to yourself. How I many know you can't get rid of yourself? How I many know you've tried? Some of you have tried. Some of you have tried the suicide route. Some of you have tried the, the struggle route, the self-loathing route, the, these things. But have you ever woken up in the morning and realized you're still there? <laughs> you're still there. The self-loathing of life is enough to derail you. Why do you perform such a smothering of life-controlling issues? How many, you know, people say, you know, there's being a mother and then there's smothering, right? I mean, you smother people, whatever. And, and, and basically, I'm just telling you right now, the situations that are in your life and the situations that you feel, it's time to stop smothering the situation. See, Saying the situation or circumstance can make you better or bitter. How many's heard that? You know, you can either be better or bitter. How many like, yeah, thank. Uh... <laughs> can I say something to you? If you want to be bitter, be bitter. If you want to live life bitter, go ahead and be bitter. It's nothing more than a cancer of the heart and the spirit and the soul. It'll eat at you. You'll never be well. You'll always be unhealthy spiritually and emotionally. But if you want to be bitter, you'll still get at them. Sure. Why not? You think if you're a bitter person, God's going to leave you behind? No. You know, it's time that you face some realities of life. Everybody in this room cannot be perfect all the time. So you're either bitter, or you're upset, or you're angry, or you're mad, or you're this, or you're that, or you're something. If God left people behind just because you were something, then why would any of us ever bother showing up here today? Let's get real. How many know I am not going to play church? We have done that, been there. You don't pay me yet anyways. So I have no salary from you, so I have no need to tell you things that you think you need to hear or want to hear. You go ahead and be bitter. Jesus will come, but you'll live miserable every single day of your life. When you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, there's healing for bitterness. There's healing for hopelessness. There's healing for that. But if you want to be bitter, then you can be bitter all on your own because I'm not interested in huddling up next to you. I, you know, how, many, how many know that when you come to Christ, He makes things better? Right? You know, you know that there's a lot of, I mean, let's face it, right? I mean, there's Christians and then there's Christians, right? There's believers and then there's believers, right? There's pretenders and then there's real, right? There's false and then there's reality, right? In this room at the gathering, we're talking about a real God in a real day, in a real time to real people about real stuff. Real stuff. Now, I mean, the things of life that you choose, they're not the best things, you know. Consider the things that course through your mind, the word that rolls off your tongue, the topic of conversation that dominates your every conversation. Do you realize that nine out of ten of your conversations are gossip and bitter? Or seeking information about somebody? So, what about, trust me, I know, I've lived there, done that, still there, do that, and I just love the fact that I am people's table talk. I do, I just absolutely love it. I think it's fantastic. 
Do you know that you'll even hold negative conversations with complete strangers? You will. And you know what? There's something that's really interesting about humanity. They feel their best when people are lower than them. You heard me, right? You feel your best. You, have you ever noticed that, that you know, your emotions start to change when someone starts crying? Yes. But until they start crying, you really don't change. How I many know you keep at it, keep at it, keep in there? And, and then they start to weep and you go, oh, you know what? Um, because you feel your best when somebody else is broke worse than you. And at some place in life, wouldn't you rather be the person that lifts up instead of tears down, that, that builds up instead of breaks, that, that, that lifts instead of wounds, that heals instead of hurts? Yes. See, Jesus, why did Jesus pray in the garden? I mean, many would have a lot of guesses when he said these words let this cup pass from me how many remember those words when he said let this cup pass from me how many wish that that some of the things you are facing in your life that the lord would just allow to pass some of the things that's going on in home in life in families in situations in trials how many hear what i'm saying to you right now listen to me teenager young person we all have things that we wish would just pass and Jesus got on his knees before the crucifixion and said, let this pass from me. And many people surmise why he said it. I mean, do you think Jesus was saying, let this cup pass from me because he was afraid of the crucifixion? Do you think it was because he was terrified of the beating and the lashing? And, he, and how many know that that would be understandable if Jesus was a bit terrified by the beating that he was about to receive, the crucifixion was about to receive? Matthew 27 said this, and in the ninth hour of verse 46, and Mark recorded it the same, Jesus cried out with a loud voice and said this, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who stood there, when they heard Jesus cry this out, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. You still don't get it. You, still, you see, you still don't understand that this man is the Son of God and he's calling to the Father. And these people think, oh, he's calling on Elijah. I'm, what I'm saying to you is this. He wasn't afraid of the beating, wasn't afraid of the crucifixion, wasn't about, you know, being crucified or whatever, even though those were worthy things to be afraid of. Listen to what he's saying. When he finally got to the cross and took on your sin and took on your burden and took on your trouble and took on your trial, he realized what was going to happen. What happened in the garden? God forsook Adam and Eve and cast them out of the garden. The worst thing that could ever have happened, broken communion with God the Father, the Creator. Jesus is praying in the garden because he knows once he, he who is sinless takes on your sin, there is going to come a break from God the Father and all of a sudden in the ninth hour God says why have you forsaken me the worst thing that anybody could ever imagine being separated from God no wonder he prayed you know if there's a way that we can pass through this without you and I being separated Jesus teaching in the temple in John 8, he said this. When Jesus had raised himself up, he saw no one but the woman. Because Jesus was teaching in the temple, and how many know, and here's another story y'all know, because you use this all the time. The story of the adulterous woman that was thrown by the Pharisees at the feet of Jesus, correct? How many follow what I'm saying to you? Just verify. And you all know the story because you, you love the story because it's easy to remember and it's easy for you to quote and use in condemnation format. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they threw Jesus at, you know, and they said the law says she should be stoned because she committed adultery, right? And so Jesus went on about his business and he started talking 
And, uh, and he said to the woman, where are your accusers? Because he said to them, if you are one who's accusing, cast the first stone if you're without sin, right? So the non-judgmental and the non-condemnation people who are trying to defend themselves will say, you without sin, cast the first stone. How many of you know what I'm saying to you? Because you've used it. Right? When someone speaks to you about what you've done, what you've said, where you've been, whatever, and you go, oh, you without sin cast the first stone, so I don't live in glass houses, and you get all these things, and you refer to that, right? <coughs> and then you who are in condemning mode go, well, Jesus said, you know, to the sinful woman, the adulterer said, get up and go and sin no more. You're not supposed to sin anymore. <laughs> All right, do you want me to preach you the cliche way of, of Scripture? Do you want me to preach to you what will somehow make you feel something better? Or do you want the truth so that it will somehow help you when you, not yourself, but when you speak to others? Because God help you when you speak to others. God help you when you talk to sons and daughters and friends and family. God help you when you talk to people and you have a condemning and judgmental spirit that somehow thinks that you have risen yourself above and you are the authoritative person. Let me tell you this right now. You did not hang on a cross for my sin, but there was a God named Christ who did, who allowed grace and mercy to then flow over my life. Hear this closely. Listen to this. And Jesus said, no one, uh, she said to Jesus, no one is here, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. How many love that part, right? But, but you know, the point is, is who confirms that she didn't? I love that Who confirms when, when Jesus said, go and sin no more, right? Because that's what you use for your condemning statement and verse of Scripture to say, you know, once Jesus has forgiven you of your sin, now you go and sin no more. Who confirms that she did not sin again? Because how many know, if she didn't, she's a better woman than you. Please tell me. Please tell me there are things that God's been dealing with you on and you ask for forgiveness and God forgives you and you rise up and you in every intention in your heart and mind never to fall in that place again, but somehow you find yourself there. And so then Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. They interrupted Jesus in the temple talking to people about being the light in the darkness with this adulterous woman, throwing her at his feet, wanting something from her. And so finally he said, look, I forgive you. Your sins are forgiven. Now let me get back to the subject at hand, which is light in darkness, which is confession of the heart, which is you coming in repentance and asking for forgiveness so that you can be light in this dark world. I'm telling you something. How many would just light? To be a light in darkness. Would you not like that? Would you like that somehow? There's a lot of scripture. I mean, Job 29.3 said, When his lamp shone upon my head, and when by his light I walked through darkness. Job said, I walked through darkness through the light of Christ. Psalm David said in 91.5.6, You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, or destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right side but how many know in Christ nothing can come nigh under your dwelling that God Almighty hasn't got in hand and control amen, amen. 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 Ephesians 5 8 said for you were once darkness but now you are light in the Lord walk as children of light amen, amen. first John 2 11 but he who hates his brother is in darkness He who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. How many just want to let it go, to release it? You're tired of the darkness, aren't you? 
tired of the dark place, aren't you? You may walk in darkness of this world, but when you come to the knowledge that you have found in Christ, darkness falls praise to the light that now lives within you. Let me tell you something. I got this to say. There is even no shadow of turning in Christ Jesus, meaning don't get thrown off course. There is no deceit in Christ. He loves you. He cares for you. 